This is Support is Sexy, episode 77 with Katherine Finney, founder of Digital Undivided. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm thrilled to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. So today I am so excited to welcome Miss Catherine Finney. And Catherine is a friend and a founder of Digital Undivided, which is a organization, a movement really, that is um, doing so many things, but really focused on empowering women in technology. And Catherine is what I call an OG in the technology space. She found at the blog, The Budget Fashionista, back in, I believe it was 2003. You'll hear more about that in this episode. But the blog was one of the first, if not the first, really huge fashion lifestyle blogs. And she later sold the company, talks about that in this episode and all of those things. So really a wealth of knowledge and just a great, cool person. So in this episode, you'll hear from Catherine how to change the disparity and how few Black and Latino women founders get investments, especially in the technology space why you should only take investment to get growth, not to get started, other ways that family and friends can invest in you and in your business that you may not have considered. This is beyond money. She also talks about three ways to decouple yourself from your brand so that it can stand alone, four reasons that people buy into a technology company, very important, how she built and sold her blog, The Budget Fashionista, her advice for consultants looking to work with big corporations, the shift to the 1099 economy. I'm sure if you haven't felt that yet, you will feel it or you've experienced it or seen it. The economy is changing. Everyone is adjusting and figuring out how this works. So Catherine talks about that. She also talks about on a personal note, how becoming a parent empowers you to say no and mean it. And she also talks about what entrepreneurs might want to consider when looking for love. Catherine also talks about the power of asking for support, which, you know, we're all about it, and why support networks, especially with people who aren't afraid to tell you about yourself, are key to your success. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode full of great information and great resources. And to get a look at those resources, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com. Look for Catherine's episode. You can do that through search and you will see all of the links to the great resources that Catherine mentions in here. This way you can go find out more information. My goal is to provide you with as many resources as I can based on what our guests provide. This way you can move forward in a way that is empowered. Thank you so much again for being here. Without further ado, Catherine Finney. So Catherine, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. I so appreciate you. You always say yes and show up when you can, when your schedule allows. (laughs) I have to ask you the question, the first question I ask everyone. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh, gosh. Um, That is so hard because I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always had, like, my hustle game Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So if I had to think, oh, gosh, it probably was growing up um my grandmother was a seamstress and she had her own sewing business and i spent a lot of time with her um when i was much much younger in my early childhood and so just being around her and seeing her conduct business um had a big impact on me um not only do i know how to sew and i can put together some some things mm-hmm. um but i also saw her handle business and i her be you know the small business owner. And that definitely had an impact on me from a very early age. Now, where did you grow up? Well, I grew so I was born in Milwaukee. And every time I say Milwaukee, people think, you know, oh, Laverne and Shirley and stuff like that. <laughs> it, and it, it was kind of like that. But you know, I grew up in Milwaukee in a very um, uh, blue collar, but middle class family. Mm-hmm. Um, that was devastated when the factory shut down. Um, my father was a brewery worker. 
he worked for Schlitz Brewery. And like many people who lived in places like Milwaukee, Gary, Detroit, you know, in the early 80s, the factory shut down and, and really devastated our communities. They just left. Um, some were open one day and then literally the next day they were like closed and gone. Right. Um, so it had a big impact on, on me and my family. Um, my father though had this vision for himself that really, he just saw himself bigger than his current situation. Um, and I really realized now much older how that impacted me, um, because he took this course at a workforce development center, um, learned how to code, took an internship at 36, and then got a job in Minneapolis, of all places. And people who don't know the Midwest would think Milwaukee and Minneapolis are the same place, and they're really, really not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the same really place. Not. Really, really not the same place. And so my family, we moved to Minneapolis when I was eight. But I spent a lot of time... I'm going actually back and forth between Milwaukee and Minneapolis. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, particularly in the summers in Milwaukee, and but grew up in Minneapolis. Um, so very Midwest, very very Midwest, very Midwest. That's so interesting about your dad and and brilliant that he thought to or was even open to taking something completely outside of what he was doing at that time and then introduced to this whole new area of who knew what it was going to end up being, right? With being able to code and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I think he could sense the future, Mm -hmm. right? And where things were heading. And I, and I actually think most people have that innate ability inside themselves to sense where things are heading, Mm -hmm. but most of us are afraid to actually follow that, to actually go there. Right. It's, it's, security in staying in what you know, even in, when what you know isn't working. Right. Um, and so I think my father was kind of like, you know, looking around our community. And when the factory shut down, it really devastated Milwaukee because you had people who hadn't graduated from high school who were making 40, 50 K a year. This is in the early eighties. Mm-hmm. So, and some were making 70, 75 K working overtime. So all of a sudden, no job prospects, couldn't work anywhere, couldn't even buy a job. Right. And so my father, in fact, didn't graduate from high school until he was in his 30s. And so, you know, he saw that this wasn't going to go anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. He, he, he could see that, like there wasn't going to be any opportunities. And also knew that he was brilliant. I mean, and I think he kind of had a sense that he was smart, but he wasn't the type of person to tell you that, you know, mm-hmm. but you got the sense that he was really smart um, and was able to translate that. And he also um, made what I think is a, a very smart choice on his part. He married my mother <laughs> um, and and he was smart enough to do that, <laughs> too. Um, <laughs> And and my mother, who came from a different background than him, his background was very blue collar. My mother's background was very, you know, bougie black. My mother was a debutante. My mother went to, you know, college. My mother was is a Delta. You know, like all of those sort of things she had, but she saw something in him, um, and was really able to help him, and really help bring that out in him. Um, and as a result, my father, when he passed, he was, you know, a, a quite a wealthy man um, when he passed away. As But they built it together. Right. Um, that's one of the pieces of advice I give to other entrepreneurs is, you know, marry someone useful. Marry someone mm. who partners with somebody who has a skill. Um and even if it's like a carpenter, I'm not talking about somebody who's a lawyer, doctor, who has got bank. I'm not even saying that. Although that can be helpful too, right? Because then they can fund your ambition. Right. But, um, but marry someone who, you know, a carpenter, someone who works. Because while you're doing what you're doing, somebody's got to feed the kids. Someone's got to feed you. Somebody's got to pay the bills. 
And by marrying someone who has a strong work ethic and someone who can do things, you know, while you're off fulfilling this dream, you know that you're going to be able to eat and you'll have things like health care and those, those, all those other things, which are so crucially important. Um, otherwise, you might as well just be by yourself. Right. Like, I was going to you know, say, I so mean, what do you think about two entrepreneurs getting married, which some people do, or, or sometimes they're already married and they end up both being entrepreneurs? Well, the challenge with that is somebody has to be a successful entrepreneur, right? <laughs> At least one person has to be successful. Um, and, and and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's, as long as, you know, there's some ground rules, I think as long as one is successful at it, because it will be a challenge to have two entrepreneurs and, and no one's doing well in their business. Um, Just for the sake also- of stability. Yeah, the stability, particularly if you have children, that that adds a whole new layer. Um, But it can work. Mm -hmm. It can definitely work. Now, what was a young Catherine like? Oh, God. (laughs) Um, Oh, my goodness. What was a young Catherine like? Oh, Lord. Tell us, tell us. You know, I was, it's so weird because I think back to like the way you see yourself is not the way other people see you. Mm -hmm. So, High school was an interesting situation for me Um, because on one hand, you know, I was popular and was my class president. On the other hand, I was like one of those people that people um, probably love to not like um, because it seemed like I had everything. Right. And so it was a very interesting situation. And growing up in a place like Minneapolis where, you know, black chicks weren't valued in Minneapolis. They just weren't like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, I don't know if they are now even, but I can tell you definitely in 90s Minneapolis, we were not the business. Mm. Like we were not, no one was checking for us. Um, And so it was really an interesting sort of situation. Um, I remember once, you know, I was going to a dance and I was really fretting because this guy who asked me was white. And my mother was like, girl, you better go. Like, you're going to stay at home? She was like, She's you know. She's focused on a dance. Right? She's like, you better go because 20 years from now, it's not going to be like, oh, man, you know, I went to that dance with the white guy. It's going to be like, why didn't I go to that dance? Right. And so, but it was a very interesting situation. So for me, I was like one of those overachiever people. Um, I was always doing a lot. Um, I always had a vision of myself, though, that was bigger. And always saw myself outside of Minneapolis. Like, I knew I wasn't going to live in Minneapolis. And my parents, if you were to talk to them, they would say, yeah, she told us at five she was leaving. <laughs> what was, was like, it that made you? you? Yeah, what, made, what do you think it was that made you know intuitively that this is, I'm bigger than this? Not that anything's wrong with Minneapolis, but that you were going to go elsewhere and do something else. I'm not a big fan of boxes and putting people in boxes, even myself. And one of the challenges about growing in the mid, one of the things that makes the Midwest really great is that it was very stable. Like childhood was very, very stable. Like I knew, um, you know, people work, um, you have a strong community. Uh, it's not a lot of the uh, appearances sort of issues that you find in other places. You don't really have those same sort of challenges in the Midwest. It's very stable and very even. Um, the challenge with that is the, one of the reasons why it's so very stable and very even is because people are put in like very defined boxes Um and it makes it makes it easier to navigate for other people because they know exactly where you fit in, right? Mm-hmm. So no one's shaking the boat, no one's throwing a wrench in it. And so here comes this like big black chick <laughs> wearing funny clothes, who's talking about how she's going to move to New York the day she graduates, um, and that throws a wrench in all of that. Right. And so th- it was it was a challenge. It was a challenge. How did you get through that time? Was it just you being committed to being yourself and being very clear about what your plans were, moving to New York after graduation and those kinds of things? You know what got me through? I found a group of friends who were just as outside thinkers as myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I always say to people, try to find your tribe. Right. Um, 
And and it's like find your tribe. Like everyone has a tribe. Everyone has like one or two people who are as equally different or kooky or weird or whatever as you. And find those people. Like no, do do whatever it takes to find those people. I was lucky because I found those people fairly early, and they're still my best friends to this day. We've mm-hmm. been friends for over thirty years now. And you know, and ironically enough, they all left and now live on the East Coast too. <laughs> Did they come after you? I mean, we all left together. We were uh, like, we're leaving. That's like, why we you're all, the same like, tribe. Right? I mean, I even, we were damn near on the same flight. We were like, <laughs> we are gone. Love ya, but gone. Mm. And then also my parents did something that, um, as a parent myself, I'm really trying to make sure that I embody. I think one of the things they gave me, which is the greatest gift I think you can give a young black child, but particularly a young black girl is to never put any limits on them. My parents never told me I could not do something. Mm-hmm. Ever. No matter how batshit crazy it was. And some of the stuff I did, I'm sure it sounded batshit crazy. Um, but they never said I couldn't do it. What did they say? Did they say go for it? Or did they just not? What, what was the response for most of it? My, well, my dad, who was this like, cr- like lovable curmudgeon person, would say, well, how much is this going to cost me? Right. <laughs> First thing. It was never like, don't do it. You can't do it. You know, you need to pay for it. It was never that. It was always that first question. And usually it would be like, oh, you know, I got a scholarship to do this. Or, oh, you know, someone else paid for it. And he's like, oh, okay, well, I'll see you then, you know. Right. And, and it was never like, oh, you can't do it. We're not going to pay for it. Because um, I always figured out I worked ever since I could work. Um Cause I just like to have my own sort of, you know, just money and just the work ethic of growing up where, I, where I grew up, everybody worked. Um, but no, they just never said it. And my mother never even said that she would just always try to find, try to find a way to make it happen. Mm-hmm. So you had that support there. I had the support. And right. so I didn't, even to this day, there's like nothing that I don't have in my mind that I can't do something. Mm -hmm. Well, which is why you do so much. And I mean, so much in the best way. I think it's important. I think that's the greatest gift a parent can give a kid is that there are no limits. Right. Try it. Ways and all that other stuff. They don't care about that. But to say there are no limits to what you can do, you can do whatever you want to do. Right. Now you mentioned you as a parent, did you have a child that I don't know about? I do. I oh do. my god! He turns one next week. Oh my gosh! Actually, on Saturday. Oh my yes. gosh! I haven't seen you in a year. I know. Oh it's my. So oh he's how. So oh. He's what? Wonderful. He's wonderful. I'm sure. What is that like? How has that changed? I didn't even know this was going to be part of the conversation. I'm excited. Congratulations. Thank you. I think being responsible for someone else's life. Um is frightening (laughs) Uh it really is it's like frightening it's frightening because it's the biggest reality check ever right biggest because you're like i don't want to i don't want to fuck this up i don't know if i can (laughs) but like really that's like i don't want to fuck like i i don't want to mess this up and particularly to a little black boy like i want him to not know any limits but how do i do that in a world that's going to be putting limits on him all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even the way we dress him, like I don't allow him to wear any aggressive things. Um, so he doesn't wear camouflage. He doesn't wear, because I'm like, he's not in the army. Mm. He's not like, he's not what he's doing. He's like one, he's a baby. He just wants to play. He has a whole bunch of different toys. He has dolls. Cause they're my dolls, my old dolls. And like he has, but he also has like, you know, he's very into technology, which makes sense. Right. (laughs) So he has like, you know, a lot of tech toys and like gadgets and he likes to put things together. And, and, but like, even that there was somebody who was like, Oh, he was wearing gray, which is a neutral color. Right. Right. And like, and someone was like, Oh, is he a, that's a, he's a boy. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, why isn't he wearing literally this person asked me this. I didn't know who this person was from anyone else. I was like, well, why isn't he wearing like, you know, blue or something? And I'm like, because he's not right. He can wear whatever damn color he wants to wear. And I put him in this, another person, 
um, we were at a store and it was like, you know, just like baby talking to him. He likes to ride in the carts. Mm-hmm. Um, it's his thing. So I'm like, oh my God, is he going to own like a chain of supermarkets? Because he loves, <laughs> love and loves him some Target. And so we're talking and I'm just like, you know, talking softly to him. And we're at the checkout line and this lady's like, do you talk softly like that to him all the time? Mm-hmm. And I said to her, like, how am I supposed to talk to him? He wasn't even one. He was like, eight months how am I supposed to talk to him am I supposed to yell at him am I supposed to be mean to him how do you talk to an a little baby boy I know what does she use is it I'm curious if she is used to seeing certain women talk to their children a certain way there must have been some expectation in her head exactly that should be like come here you know exactly and I'm like no why can't we be gentle with our little black boys right why can't we be gentle with them Right. Exactly. Because like you said, the rest of the world certainly will not be. And his father is the same way. I mean, you know, they rough house a lot more because, you know, and as a mom, it's like taking a step back and Mm -hmm. allowing that. It's that's another thing I learned, too, because, you know, instantly you want to be like, don't pick him up like that. But then you're like, no, take a step back. That's his dad. Mm -hmm. They're playing. He loves it. Right. I have like, friends who go through that, too. Over. They're always like, I'm so afraid he's going to hurt him. I know he won't mean to, but I'm so afraid he's going to hurt. But, you know, it's just a different kind of play. It's a different kind of play, right? I'm so happy and, and for you. Cute. He's amazing. He's so cute. That's amazing. Now, has that shifted in any way, the kinds of things, whether it's made you more passionate or shift any kind of um, priorities for you and the major things that you are were already working on, especially in the technology space? Well, I mean, as you know, it, it, you don't have free time Mm -hmm. Um, saying to someone every hour I could be doing something right. Um, so I'm very particular about what I do and what I say yes to and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm saying yes to doing something that means I'm saying I'm not spending time with him. Um, and so whatever I do has to be very important. And it has to be worthwhile. Um, I'm, I wasn't a fan of busy work before and definitely not a fan now. Right. Um, and just making sure like everything I do just has to be, it has to be worth it. It has to be meaningful. It has to move something. It has to mean something. Um, it's a certain clarity I think you get when you become a parent. Mm-hmm that um, allows you to make decisions in, in a way that you couldn't before. Um, it, it makes it easier for me to say no. Right. Very easy to say no. And Very you were, in, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and, put, and say no with some bass behind it. Too, with some bass, you know? some bass in your voice. Exactly. But I feel like you were, you were very clear about that even before. So as you said, it, it's more so now. It, it gives you whether more of a reason or you just have some, there's more weight behind it. As you said, the reason for saying the no's that you have to say. And I think, you know, right now entrepreneurship is such a hot topic. Like everyone wants to be on shark tank right? Um, that, you know, but not everyone. And I hate saying that everyone needs to be the entrepreneur. I won't say an entrepreneur, but the entrepreneur, right? What does that mean? Not, not everyone needs to be the lead, mm. right? Not everyone needs to be the face. Not everyone needs to be the risk taker. But that doesn't, the main risk taker. But that doesn't mean that you can't be entrepreneurial. It doesn't mean that you can't be the third person on that team or the second person or the co-founder, right? But not everyone needs to be the founder. Right. And, and you are an entrepreneur if you're the third person on a startup. You are definitely an entrepreneur because it's still very much at an early stage and you're going to have to do every piece there and you will have, you know, some ownership and stuff like that. So I think, you know, rethinking how we promote entrepreneurship um, is going to be important, particularly for our communities. Um, And then everyone is going to have to be entrepreneurial because we're heading towards a 1099 economy anyway. Right. So everyone's going to be working for themselves at some point. 
How do you think that um, shift will eventually happen? Do you think it's, well, we sort of see it happening now, but in, in spaces where there are these big corporations, for example, do you think those things will stay around or that even those companies will eventually shift to a 1099 economy, as you said? Well, they already are. I mean, if you look at the number of companies that employ consultants rather than employees, Mm -hmm. um, (coughs) excuse me, if you look at, you know, the shift to more at home working and flex time, if you look at, you know, how benefits are being given, um, you can see that we're starting to move towards that. Even large corporations are. I agree. I have friends who work at big companies. They're, you know, senior VP in different positions at big companies and they work with consultants all the time. Yes. It's just what it's just what you do now. Now, how does someone who is is a consultant, which is also an entrepreneur, how do they do you think prepare themselves or approach companies like this for these kinds of opportunities as opposed to thinking I just have to do everything on my own? You could work with a bigger corporation. Well, I think there's a couple of really interesting pathways. Um, You know, of course, it's all about who you know, right? right? So using those networks. But most major companies have requirements in terms of minority suppliers. And the minority diversity supplier sort of channel is a really great way to get into companies as partners. Mm. So... And, and supplier doesn't just mean, you know, a a physical product. It could, it means consultancy too. And so finding out how to get into those channels, I mean, they're always looking for people to work with because it's a quota that they need to fill. Um, And many are not filling it well. Um, So that's one like very clear channel. Another good channel is governmental opportunities who also have certain requirements in terms of working with diversity. Um, and inclusion. And so looking at those channels, um, most city, state, and local governments um, have some sort of, you know, initiative to get to work more with minority suppliers. Again, don't get hung up on the supplier word, but Mm -hmm. like minority companies and contractors and things like that. Yes. Now, one of the things that I just have to go back and mention with you, it's, it's one of the many reasons that you're such a boss, but you are for many reasons, um, is that you started the Budget Fashionista, the Budget Fashionista, can't pronounce it properly today, before Google, right? Is that right? Did I get that right? We did an interview with you. Not before, but Google was really young. Google was a baby when you started the Budget Fat. Just Google, to give Google people, was a tiny baby. Google was and a baby. Was- it was a tiny, tiny, tiny <laughs> baby. I remember we were so excited. This is like so dating myself. But yeah, we, what year was that? And how did you even think to start a blog at that time? That's what I wanted to really ask you. So it was 2003. Um, and thought to start a blog because at the time I was like, just got married and was like, just spending too much money. Um I was fabulous, but spending too much money. (laughs) And, you know, my husband-to-be was like, hey, you know, can you stop spending money? Maybe you should write about it. And so we used this platform called Gray Matter, which was the precursor to WordPress. So it actually, Gray Matter influenced the development of WordPress. Hmm. So we're using this platform where we had to hard code everything, everything. And there was no, the only way to add a photo was that you had to go scan it and then figure out and hard code it from the back end into your MySQL database. So there was no what you see is what you get. There was no quick upload. No upload, none of that. You had to like hard coded and then upload. I mean, it was just so much work. It took like an hour to get a picture up. Basically. <laughs> oh my God. Um, it was so, so much work. And so I started it and really was an outlet. I didn't know what it was going to turn into. I had no idea that was going to turn into what it turned into. Um, and it just really sort of took off. And it was really interesting to be there sort of at the beginning of this sort of lifestyle blogging. I mean, blogging had been around since like 96, 97. Um, and there were some early, early bloggers like Anil Dash and other folks who, who were definitely doing writing. They were doing more writing about 
sort of tech and, and gaming um, and not so much about things that were, you know, of interest to a larger community. Right. Well, and but... so, yeah, it was a lot of dudes um, yeah. writing about dude stuff. Um, and so around like 2002, 2003, there was a wave of us that came in um, that started writing about women. And I don't exactly know why we all started around the same time. I'm trying to think if there was like a catalyst. Um, there really wasn't. I know the presidential elections were coming up in 2004 and blogging was just starting to get noticed. Um, for those of you who can think back, in 2004 was the first time that blog, blogging really came into public conscious because of the swift boating thing. Mm. And, it was like the Drudge Report and all these other people who had just, you know, were starting to gain prominence, had started around that time, um, did the swift voting thing and got the swift, the people who said that they were with John Kerry, who was a presidential candidate in 2004. Um, they, they were with him and that he really didn't do what he said he did. And, you know, all the blogs sort of got a hold of that and ran with it. And that's when blogging first started to get noticed in the public conscious and any sort of level. And so um, living through that and then seeing how fast things change as a result of blogging, I mean, blogging led to Twitter, blogging led to Facebook, you know, blogging led to Snapchat and Instagram. Blogging was really the, the foundation. This user-generated content was the foundation for all of these things um, that we now see. And it's so interesting to see how the world has changed particularly the blogging and social media world. Right, and having been there from really the beginning, because the Budget Fashionista was one of the first huge fashion blogs at that time and just moving forward, right? Yeah, I think that was one of the one of the first, not even just fashion, but lifestyle in general, mm -hmm. blog. Um, and I think it was the first to be in the Today Show, the first to have like a major book deal, um, my first book was published by Random House. A lot of first, right. and and also one of the first black sort of bloggers, particularly to reach any sort of scale. And so um, it was really interesting. You know, when I started, there were none of us. Mm -hmm. There was like five, like literally. It was like Baratunde and I, mm -hmm. and like you know, Baratunde and like Cheryl Conti and I. That was like it. <laughs> like I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it was really not that many. And right. I remember going. To South by Southwest in 2007 and it was a South by Southwest in which Twitter was launched mm. um, Twitter has existed but Twitter like was like going gangbusters and I remember there being only about 30 black people there Wow! this is a South by Southwest Inter interactive maybe 15 to 20,000 people and it was if there was 30 black people I'd be surprised at the entire conference. At the entire conference. I'd be very surprised. I saw stuff there that I just, I mean, it gave me a, a peek into the tech world and some things that just were like not things that I want to see again. It was, a, it was weird. It was a very weird space. Now, what drew you to, even before blogging and, and into this technology space, space, which is where we're going, which is where you do so much incredible work now, what drew you to this space initially? Did you study it in school and then go into technology and then start the blog? Or what was your journey like into this space? Mm, completely not. Like, none of, none of that. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't um, that linear? It was not linear. Actually, so my father was introduced to technology through my dad who became um, an engineer at Microsoft. And when he passed away, he was an executive at EMC. And so I grew up around technology. I grew up, you know, from about the age of, you know, eight or nine, having a computer in my home. Um, and so really grew intimate with technology and very comfortable with it. It was always around. Um, my father, which again, to his credit, allowed us to use a computer at any time we wanted to use a computer. We had our own logins. I remember one time, like, I messed up, and then he made, he gave me this, like, huge book of, like, C++, and made me figure out the correct DOS prompt 
to get the computer back to where I want it. And I was just like, wow. dude, I just want to like play Oregon Trail. I really don't want to do all of this. <laughs> but like, you know, <laughs> like he made us do it. And so we had to learn it, my brother and I both. And it's interesting growing up with such technology, we didn't go into tech initially. Um, so I was a member of like the teen member of the Black Data Processing Association. My dad was a, a very active member mm-hmm. um, and would go to conferences and, you know, all that stuff and the high school computer team and all that other stuff. Um, but I didn't go in the computers and I went to um, Rutgers for undergrad and went for political science and got very involved in politics and interned on the Capitol Hill and at the White House. And um, when President Clinton, I'm so dating myself, but when President, <laughs> the president um, and and I did not know Monica Lewinsky. People asked me that. I did not know her. Oh um, and but you know, just being in politics and seeing how things kind of ran, I was not um, a fan of politics mm-hmm. after seeing workings. Um, and then, you know, got a fellowship and went to Ghana, West Africa for a year and a half um, because technically I'd finished college early. And so I went to Ghana and just changed my life. I became really sick while I was there. I had malaria. I had a oh whole bunch gosh. of them. I had malaria. I was so adorably cute. I looked fabulous. <laughs> then made it easy for the mosquitoes to bite me. So um, like yummy. Yummy. Thanks for wearing short skirts. Keep it American. <laughs> um, and everyone's looking at me like, you want to do that? Are you sure about that? And I was like, I look good. So, but, um, and was like, you know, became very, very ill. And that really impacted me from a health standpoint of just knowing about public health and how as an American, like I was able to get the type of health care. But initially when I was sick, um, I was in a clinic that was just a regular clinic that everybody, you know, in Ghana went to. And it was like, wow, the health disparities and healthcare disparities were like pretty shocking. Um, And so that influenced me going into public health. And so I went to Yale for my degree, my graduate degree in public health and did work on that. Um, And it was while working as a public health advocate and was while working um, as the head of the Black Women's Health Project in Philadelphia when my husband was like, you need to stop spending money and, you know, why don't you start this blog? And so I'd always been involved in like science and health and tech, but never as like a direct thing. Um, And even then when I started my blog, I still continued to work. It wasn't until I got my book deal that I was like, oh, snap, this is like actually something. Right. So at first, was it sort of like a hobby or something else just to do? Or was did you always have in mind that this will develop into some kind of business? Well, I think if you remember back, I'm pulling you all the way back to 2000. All the way back. That was right after the first Internet bubble burst. Right. Mm -hmm. So no one had really quite figured out how to make money from the Internet. No one had figured out e-commerce yet. No one no one had figured those things out. Um, So when I started, there were no business models like you didn't have. There was no one to follow. You had there wasn't. I remember us being so excited when Google AdWords came out because we finally had a way to monetize Mm -hmm. our content. Um, because before then you didn't, there was like, where would you get an ad? Um, in fact, most major publications didn't even have web departments and they outsourced a lot of their content to organizations like the AP, or they just repurposed and repackaged stuff that they did offline. So there was no business model. There was no path at that point because no one had created it. Um, it, and it was people like myself and other folks who created the path. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it's interesting because I remember one of my friends was like the first, I'm pretty sure she was the first style blogger. Um, her name is Patricia, um, Hanischel, and she was the first to take pictures of herself and put it online and took pictures of her closet, put it online. She later sold her, her site. But, you know, we often talk about, like, how far things have come and have gone. But when we were doing it, there was no business model. 
Right. So she was doing selfies before selfies and the style blogging or like people post on Instagram, the outfit of the day. She was kind of doing that back then. Back back then, back in 2003. Right. And what's interesting about it, too, um, is we talk now, I was just reading about Glam, better known as Mode, which was one of the first companies to really monetize lifestyle content for women online. Mm-hmm. And I was saying to someone, I think I was maybe the first or second blogger signed to Mold. Mold just went under. It just went bankrupt. Um, and I signed my contract, maybe this was 2005. So it, it took that long from two to three years from the time I started for there to start to be even ads and ad tech. All of that was like invented in really in the past 10 years. Right. Now you got to the point where you eventually sold the budget fashionista, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was that decision like? Was it sort of just uh, the opportunity came up at the right time and you decided to do that? Because I don't think a lot of people or maybe they do. I I should speak for myself. I don't necessarily think about, you know, selling a blog and then moving on from it. It just is something that most of us don't have as a concept, as a possibility. You know, it's so interesting. I don't I wish I was asked that question more um, Yay. because I think it's like, you know, a really important question. And so when I was doing TBF, it was so tightly aligned with me. Like I was the budget fashionista for many years. And I remember going to a friend towards the end. I was kind of getting bored with it. And I saw that things were going in this way of like taking pictures of yourself and stuff like that. And I'm not that person. Um, and so I remember talking to a friend who ran a hedge fund and I said, you know, what? I think I want to sell this because I just don't want to, you know, do it anymore. And he's like, well, no one's going to buy it. And I was like, what? He's like, no one's going to buy it. And I was like, well, why? And he said, because it's all about you mm. and no one's going to want to buy that because if you leave and it's not about you, then what's the value? So if you want to sell this, you have to decouple it from you. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> like, you know, at first I was like, he just smacked me in my face. And then I was like, oh, OK. But he, you know, gave me like an ice pack. <laughs> but um, right. it's like, OK, but but and that made sense. And so I spent like two years decoupling myself from the site. And how did you do that? Well, I hired other people to start writing. I reduced the amount of times that I was writing. Mm. Um, I hired other people. I hired an actual editor in chief, um, who's amazing, who I'm still friends with. Um, and I started writing less when I was on TV, I would make them say, cause before I would just say the budget fashionista, I had them change to say founder of the budget fashionista or founder of www.thebudgetfashionista.com. So that made it, it, again, separated myself. So I wasn't the budget fashionista. I just worked and then it started this this brand. Right. But I wasn't, wasn't the brand, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it was stuff like that. So we had to come up with strategies, making sure that the partnerships weren't tied to me or the partnerships that were tied to me that they were like separated, right? That it was like, here's Catherine Finney, this is a separate company, and here's TBF. And if you want to run ads on TBF, but you also want me to be a spokesperson, those are going to be two different agreements because right. they're two different types of people. And, and so that's what it did. It took like two and a half years to do that. Wow. Uh, and in the meantime, I was doing like television and stuff like that. So it was like, you know, everything had to be separate. It was a lot of work. But in the end, it created an entity that could stand on its own. Um, and now I don't even know. I don't even check this out. I have no idea what's going on with it. I see the people. <laughs> I looked on at the it the other day. Yeah, doing my research. I looked and I was like, wow, it's so interesting to see it different. And as you mentioned, separate from you, but it's its own its own site. But I think it's, uh, thank you for sharing that story. And I think it's uh, interesting too the answer, because a lot of times people might just think, oh, I'm not interested in this anymore. I'll just shut this down. As opposed to you thinking, no, I'm not interested in it, or I'm ready to move on from this. I'm going to sell it because you knew it had value. It had to have value. Um, And I think that's important to, you have to create the value. Mm -hmm. And so, (laughs) You know, TBF, there's four reasons, one of four reasons that people usually buy a tech company. 
uh, or at least or by a company that's involved in the tech space. And that's traffic, talent, tech, or like I like to say, taxable income. And so it's either you have a massive amount of traffic or you have targeted traffic that this particular brand or entity wants to capture. And it's cheaper for them to buy you than to try to capture that themselves. That's one way. Another is talent. Like they want you. You have some secret sauce or some knowledge that no one else has or would be really hard for them to find. And and for that, they're buying it because they want you to be on board. Um, Tech is that you have some technology that it is cheaper for them to buy and acquire than it is for them to go out and create it themselves. And then taxable income is, is that you just are making so much money from this site and it's a revenue stream that this particular brand or entity wants to get themselves. And maybe it's cheaper for them to buy you who already has existing than them to try to create it. And so it's really important when you're thinking about selling almost anything, particularly in this tech space, that you think of how, for what one of those four reasons is someone going to buy me? Mm-hmm. And in the case of TBF, it was traffic. And we had a dedicated, large population that would have taken the entity that bought it a while to, they probably would never have gathered as much as we did. Um, and because we were so old and been around for so long, we had very strong SEO. Right. And how many years at that point, What? how many years had you had the blog? You started in around 2000? About 10 years 10 at years, that point. Right. So that was a lot of good Google juice in that. Right, a exactly. Lot of good Especially since Google um, was a baby when you started. Right? You so grew and, up and, with Google. We grew up with Google. And so, you know, that's primarily why they bought it. And probably a little bit of the taxable income because we had some strong partnerships too. Um, but when you're selling anything in this space, may it be a blog, may it be um, a brand, like think of like – where do I fit into those four things? The challenge for a lot of um, particularly bloggers and social media stars now is that they don't have a product outside of themselves. Right. And that's very difficult for someone to buy it. Like they are their product. Right. They are the um, brand. They are their brand. And as a result, like, you know, TBF was a separate entity. It was a website that existed outside of Catherine. It wasn't me putting my, you know, if you, there were no pictures of me hardly on, on the site. So if you took my pictures off, it wasn't going to ruin the traffic or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of these, you know, social media stars now, it's so tightly identified with them that no one can buy it because it's not going to retain its value if they're not involved. So interesting because there's there's both sides of it. Your what you're saying, of course, makes so much sense. But then in other places, everyone sort of falls into this idea that no, but you, people have to see you. It has to be about you. The brand has to be about you. But as you're mentioning, there are smart, wise reasons to separate those two things. And as you said, you can still be founder of whatever that thing is you're doing, but you don't have to be the thing. Well, if you want to sell your company, right now, right. if you don't want to sell and you want to like, you know, be the face and floss and like, you know, Mm -hmm. have on the gram and, you know, do it for the vine, like all of that. That's totally cool. I mean, that's more of a lifestyle business and you can make a ton of money doing that. I have friends who are just making money hands over fist. Um, But will they be able to sell that? Probably not. Right. Right. Now, today, you're a founder of Digital Undivided, a fantastic company, and you, because we're talking about working with founders and giving advice to founders. But one of the things that Digital Undivided has a mission of is doubling the number of Black and Latina entrepreneurs who raise funding by 2020. Mm -hmm. And your team released the Project Diane study that sort of quantified just how big this disparity is between how black and Latina entrepreneurs get investment or not compared to white male startups or their white male counterparts. Yeah. Yeah. Now what I wanted to ask you, what can really be done to change this? Is it, is it possible to change this? Obviously you think so because you're doing this work and very passionate Mm -hmm. about it, but what can we do to make VCs recognize the values of our company? Well, I think the, I would even take it out, take the power in their hands um, and look at it in a different way. And what we 
focus on is helping people build great companies. And because at the end of the day, you don't want to take investment. And as someone who's a, an active angel investor, I can tell you, you don't want my money because I'm going to have certain requirements from you. Mm-hmm. And, I'm going to, and, I, and by taking my money, that means that I have a say in your company. And you may not want me to have a say in your company. So, you know, raising investment is, should be only, you should only get investment in which to fuel growth, not to get started. Mm-hmm. And, and that's something I feel like our communities don't get. Like, because it's not free money. This isn't free money. They're going to be breathing down your necks. They're going to have certain requirements. They're going to make you want to grow faster and grow in directions that you may not want to go. And you won't have as much say because they do own a part of your company. And so I think it's really important for people to realize that. And so how we change it is focusing on building great companies. Um, and companies that are can rapidly grow and scale and, and learning what that means to grow and scale. Um, because if you are having millions of followers or millions of customers, you're going to get people who are going to want to invest in you. Case in point is the Shade Room. The Shade Room has a number of white guy VC investors in it now. And oh. I'm talking about the Shade Room, like the Instagram, the Shade Room. Right, yes. yeah, yeah. That's right? interesting. But, I didn't know that. But it's because they've proven that even, you know, though Facebook and Instagram shuts them down like every other week, they still get 5 million, you know, followers right back. And that's because their brand is so strong and they're looking at ways to move content and and sell things. And they're doing a really great job at that. Um, but that, that's because they have this ability to move people that inherently they have a good business. And so doing that, that's like the first step. The second step, too, is, and this is something that I learned from the SBA um, administrator, Maria Contreras-Sweet. Um, she mentioned she is a Latina woman who started a community bank in California. Mm-hmm. The way she started the community bank was she had friends and family members designate her as a recipient of part of her 401k funds, of their 401k funds. I didn't know that you can direct your 401k funds to whatever you want to direct them to. Meaning when you retire or what do you mean direct it to? Or Working and investing. So for example, say you work at IBM, and you contribute to your 401k and you designate where you want your contributions to go. Right. You can say, I want my 401k contributions to go in my cousin's startup. Hmm. Did not know I, that. I did not know that. Did not know that. That was something I learned like two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You, Yeah. And that's how she started her community bank is that she went to family and friends and say, hey, I want to start a bank. And, you know, they weren't necessarily comfortable writing $10,000 checks right away, but they were comfortable designating a part of their 401k to her community bank. Interesting. Didn't very, very know that. What's the, do you know the name of her bank? If not, I'll just look up her name. I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember the name of her bank. I'll link to yeah, it. Yeah, no, so it's people... easy to find her. She's amazing. Awesome. Um. But, you know, so there's things that we can do. Also putting pressure on our pension funds. Um, Many of us have family members who worked in factories, who were teachers, who were police officers, bus drivers, so forth. And the municipal employee and teacher unions in particular are incredibly strong unions and pretty much fuel most of the investment in venture funds themselves. So most of the venture capitalists' bosses, which are limited partners, these are people who have an interest in their fund, but they don't necessarily control the fund, um, and they're the bosses of the venture capitalists, they're really our parents and grandparents, and some of us. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can put pressure on these funds. You can put pressure on the heads of your pension funds to say, look, I want to make sure that you guys are investing in funds that actually have a thesis in which they're going to invest in people of color 
or women or what have you. You can put pressure on your pension funds to do so. By requesting that they look into these kinds of funds and not just the standard of what they give everybody. Yeah. Or just saying, make sure that these funds, make sure that these funds invest in people who reflect the people who are part of these pension funds. Right. Because again, you can take your money out of the pension fund and put it to something else. You can do that. You don't have to keep it in the pension fund. Mm -hmm. Which none of us, many of us don't even consider doing something like that. Don't even consider it. Right. So as you, to your, to your point about all of this, it's that example of not waiting for VCs or other people to invest in us, thinking of other ways that we can receive this investment, not being stuck on what it looks like. Not being stuck in what it looks like. I also think crowdfunding is a huge opportunity for us um, because, you know, our family members might not be able to write a thousand dollar check, but, you know, maybe could do 50 or a hundred. Um, and then there's also other resources that we have as communities that we don't tap into because of our own issues around vulnerability. Some of it, a little bit is on us too. So for example, um, there's one kid I met with and he had like this startup that he was doing around sort of videos and I, and he's a member of a big church here in Atlanta. And I'm like, so why aren't you going to your church? Like, why don't you ask your pastor if you can get up and explain what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And like, it was just kind of like, you know, that's a resource, right? Like a major resource. And here's this young black man trying to do something well. Most people are going to put five, ten dollars in the plate for that. Um, And, you know, you have five thousand people at your, you know, church. You could raise twenty five thousand dollars. Or there might be somebody at your church who's like, you know what? I want to invest in you, young man. I have an extra $5,000 that I want to give to you. Right. And like you, you said, know, we don't also, even think about that as a resource, that, that things that are right in front of us are right around us that we're already connected to. Or even our families. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we often think of it as the resources writing the check. But if you have a family member who can take care of your children and not charge you, mm. like, that's a major savings. If you have a family member, your mother who comes in and maybe cooks for you or cleans for you or, you know, do something that makes it so that you can focus on your business, that's a huge investment. Most of our families want to help us. They want to be involved. And I find sometimes with particularly black entrepreneurs, we don't give them a way to be involved. Right. Um, there's a reason why my entire family is involved in what I do. And that's because they like to. My mother's retired. She likes coming and doing stuff and able to help. And, you know, my husband's deep in tech as an engineer and he likes working with startups and people. So I'm giving them a path. And even my grandma, who's in her 90s, you know, she likes to scan the Facebook. She calls it the Facebook. <laughs> the Facebook, you know? exactly. It's like keeping me abreast of like what's going on in everyone else's, you know, situation on the Facebook But, you know, like anytime I'm on TV, my grandparents will tape it for me. I don't have a VCR, but, you know, they'll tape it. So I know that it's there um, if I ever need (laughs) it. You know, (laughs) like that tape. Never forget that tape. But those are like little things, right, that we, you know, and actually that was a big thing. Because when I was doing TV earlier before we had DVRs and stuff like that, to buy those tapes from, you know, to buy those tapes from like media companies would often be like $150, $200 a pop. So my grandparents who would tape all the things I was doing, they were saving me $150 to $200 a pop. Right. And that there's the investment again, letting and go of what it looks like and being open to where you can get the support. And our families want to support us. Mm-hmm. Have to think of ways to have them support us. Like they want to support us. They want to help. They really, really want to help. I think one of the things, too, this leads perfectly into, I just have a few more questions for you, but leads perfectly into what you wrote on Medium, the column about closed mouths don't get fed, Black women Mm -hmm. and the language of the ass, which was such an incredible piece. I shared it, I don't know how many times, it it was so good. But one of the things you said, you talk about this vulnerability, this idea of being empowered enough to ask. And one of the quotes was, it's a privileged position to think that if you ask someone for something, anything, that you will in fact receive it, that you as a living, breathing human have a right to dream and to believe it. As a result, the 
the entire concept of dreaming becomes a radical act. So I wanted to ask you about that piece and about this idea of dreaming being a radical act, especially for black women, for women, for a lot of us. And this idea of asking for support being such a struggle for us and why? Well, we historically haven't had anybody to ask for help, right? We were always the person people were turning to for the help. Um, and we were carrying everyone on our shoulders. Everybody was on our shoulders. And so who did we turn to except for each other, right? We And, and so it's created this space in which we don't ask because we don't get And we've been conditioned to expect that. And I think things are changing a bit, right? I think think Mrs. Obama has opened our eyes to the possibilities for us um, and and what could happen. I think also, I think a lot of us have been afraid to dream big because, again, we often would dream and and not get get it, right? Mm -hmm. We'd be like, I want this so bad but I know that I'm not going to get it. Or people would tell us that we're not going to get it. Um, And I think we're, we're changing that. I see a lot of us starting to do the work to change. I'm seeing a lot of us starting to do, um, to take care of our mental health, our physical health and our mental health, right? Which hasn't been something that has been encouraged. And so, but, but that's a position of privilege to think that you can get whatever you ask for. Um, and I realized even myself, what, what privilege I grew up with, this thinking that I could do whatever I could want to do mm-hmm. and no one told me otherwise, you know, that that's a privileged position. And so the question for people like myself who are doing this work is how do we give other people that privilege? How do we have other people see that they can also do that too? And how do we do that? Is it being an example of that or is it? I think it's it's partially role modeling. I mean, I say to people, 75% of what we do is role modeling. 25% of it is like the service work and stuff like that. But it's really role modeling and showing people the possibilities. We have a space here in Atlanta called Big. Yes. It doesn't stand for anything. It just means big. Um, and it's big in very big block letters. And the reason why we call it Big is we want people to give our community the permission to think big, to dream big and be big. And we know we're speaking it into existence by just saying it, you instantly start to think big. Um, and, and that's part of it is like showing people the possibilities, showing what you can do. And some people have a problem with this whole, you can't be what you can't see, but but I don't mean that just literally, you can't even be what you can't dream. Like if you can't mm-hmm. visualize, some way, whether it's in front of you, like literally you can't see it or you can't see it in your mind, you can't do it. You have to have this possibility. And I think one of the reasons um, why I can see so big is because I don't, I could see it in my mind of where the possible, where it could be. Yeah. I always say you go there in your mind first. You go there in your mind and it's like, okay, I can do that. And so but I think for our communities, particularly Black and Latino communities, we have to give permission. We have not, and I was saying to someone who questioned me about you, you be what you can't see and the permission thing. I said, you know, you realize there was a time where I could not live in my neighborhood here in Atlanta where I live without someone wanting to lynch me. You understand that, right? Mm-hmm. There was, and at, and this time was like thirty years ago. Like we're not, we're not talking about a hundred years 100, or two hundred. Right. We're like, so that I needed permission to come into the area that I now live. I needed actual permission, and in some cases, even a pass or ID that said that I could come in because I was working for, i.e., belong to somebody who was white who lived in this area. I was like, so. We are not, it's not like we're pulling this from like some deep psychosis within us. The world really did make it so that we had to have permission to go into certain spaces. And if we didn't have permission, that meant that we could be killed and we're killed today even for that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is a radical act to say that we could do whatever we want to do when the world is telling us differently. 
That's right. Now talk about, you mentioned it just now, the big innovation center in Atlanta that you created and what the space is and what you hope it does for entrepreneurs. Yeah, so it's the big incubator program is housed there and we're really excited about it. We have seven um, companies that are founded or co-founded by black women and Latina women. So we have four black women-led companies, three Latina-led companies. Um, And the space really is about us. Um, We designed it with us in mind, us meaning women who are women of color. Um, You know, we have Oprah wallpaper. We have a little Oprah wall. Um, Everyone's like, Oprah, that's Oprah. People take pictures in front of the Oprah. Um, We call it the Oprah because it's this, you know, Oprah's face over and over again. But but we do that um, not only, you know, as an homage to Oprah, who's like our patron saint, but also, you know, if we're asking people to think big, why not put the face of one of the most successful women, one of the most successful entrepreneurs, period, in front of them every day? So when you walk in, you see her and instantly your mind goes to, OK, that's Oprah. And, you know, Oprah's big. And so we we're literally Speaking and demonstrating and showing and giving permission. We have a big picture of Shirley Chisholm, a poster from um, her presidential campaign that says "Vote Shirley 72." Mm. Um, we, you know, we have a number of things. We have a big picture of um, Ciela Cruz, um, the salsa innovator. Yeah. Um, we have, I mean, so it's all these different things that giving permission that who we are we come from greatness and that we come from people who thought bigger than, than their current situations. And we can do that too. And so what we hope is by us being there and, and having this space is that we're giving other people permission to do the same. We're saying you can think big, right? It's okay. We give you permission. Now it's a 16, is it a 16 week uh, incubator program that, that companies can apply for or how do people become involved with it if they're interested? Yeah, so we're in our mid- we're in the middle of our first cohort. Um, applications for the next cohort probably won't come out till next summer. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll have other programming starting next January. Okay, um, that will be we have our start program, which are for people who are interested in starting a tech company but have no idea what that means. Mm-hmm. It's just like a, a workshop. We um, we call it Lean Startup for the Hood. Um, nice. and, and, but it's like, how do you, how do you even, what does that mean to start a tech company? What does it mean? What do you have to do? What are the first steps? I don't even know what that means. I have an idea. I don't have anything put together. Where do I go? Um, and that's what start is. And so our incubator, that's going to, our first one is going to be in January after our demo day. I would encourage anyone who's in Atlanta or who's really interested in what we're doing to um, join us for our demo day. Our demo day is January 14th, mm-hmm. um, 2017. It's going to be in Atlanta. That's Martin Luther King weekend. Um, and you'll actually be able to see the companies who's done all this amazing hard work um, demo their their products and demo their companies and what they've been working on. Um, and that's a great way to get an idea of what we do um, and to be able to see the end result and also get an idea of how hard it is to do this. Right. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat this for anybody. This is not for the faint at heart. Um, now, where can people you, go to find out about the the demo day and just more about Big in general? Is there a website we can give, or is it our digital um, undivided dot okay. com? We're also on the twitters. On the twitters. Um, it, on the twitters, our Twitter handle is dig undiv d i g u n d i v. Um, you can also follow me. I'm Catherine Finney. Um, on Twitter, uh, we do a lot on Twitter. We have a very active Facebook page. It's, um, digital undivided on Facebook. Um, and so, and we have some other things that we're rolling out to, if you are the founder of a tech startup and you're a black or Latina woman, um, we would love for you to add yourself to the project Diane database. Um, and that's a link off our website. Um, and we're again collecting information. We'll probably have another report come out, um, probably then 2017, but 2018 every two years. Um, just sort of where have things gone? Where are we going? 
um, so that's one way that you can be involved. Um, we're starting back our tweet chats as well. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it's, that's a great way to ask, ask some questions, get some feedback on your idea. Um, I'm always amazed by like no one, like very few people actually tweet me and ask me, oh, Catherine, what do you think of this I, company idea I have? Um, and I'm always like, you know, people want to email and I'm like, don't email me. I'm not going to answer that. But like, if you tweet me, I will answer you. Right. People, you see, people probably don't Twitter. realize that. Okay. So every, well, not everyone. Let's, let's do it slowly. People can tweet Catherine, ask her a question about technology so she can, when she can get back to you and answer the question. Cause I think to your point, you're so <laughs> right for you and other people who just think, Oh, that person won't get back to me or there's no point or that kind of thing. But I actually have seen more and more people start again to really reach out to people through Twitter. I remember yeah. having a conversation with this woman who's a founder. I can't remember who it was at the time, but I remember talking to her and asking about email or what was the best way to contact. And she was just like, oh, the best way is Twitter. And I was thinking Twitter messages or Twitter. I don't understand, but people really use Twitter as a way of communicating now. Well, I like it because, you know, if you send me an email, that's only helping you. If you send me a Twitter tweet and I answer it, it's helping everybody else who's in my Twitter mm. Twitter. The Twit, Twitter timeline. <laughs> right. That's like a hard to say. Twitter timeline. It's right. hard to say that fast. Um, but it helps everyone. And so it's not just you. It allows me to help other people because other people, I'm sure, probably have that same question too. Yes, that's a, that's a great reason. That's I'll think of that from now on. So everyone to know, I'll have links to everything. I just want you to mention it for the people who are listening. So what does your support network look like? Just the last few questions for you. What does Catherine's support network look like? I mean, I'm very fortunate. I have um, my family, my my core family, um, are just so incredibly supporting and loving of me. Mm-hmm. I mean, as anyone who's ever been to a focus conference knows that my mom and my mother in law yes. were often the people that checked you. Yes, <laughs> your mom, your mom was have it together. Like, don't come in here playing. This is about business, right? Like, she's <laughs> not playing with y'all. Um, <laughs> And, you know, but my older brother, who was an executive at Oracle, and now he's an executive at another tech company, you know, would come and teach courses on sales and, like, was really supportive. My husband, who's an engineer, a software engineer, has always been supportive. Again, never telling me I couldn't do something. Was like, go for it. You know, I got you. And, you know, and even my my baby, who he can't really – say many words except for three or four key words but just even when I see him he's so happy to see me and like so in love with mommy and it just to have that is so I mean you know after a hard day and coming home and and to that like you know he's like mommy and it's like you know it just it it just builds me up and, and and it's like okay this is why I'm doing it I can go back you know, out there again, because he, you know, he loves me and he just loves me. He doesn't know anything else other than, you know, this is my mama and I love her. That's my homie. Mm -hmm. Um, I have really great friends who've known me for a really long time and knew me before I was anything. Um, And it's really important. I always say to people, you know, um, especially when I mentor people who are my friends who are in social media, and I'd say to them, you're going to have a lot of new friends, but don't forget the people who knew you before all of this, because there's going to come, be a t- come a time where you're going to really need them. And for me, I'm very fortunate that I have friends and I'm not super old, but like friends who have been my friends for like 20, 30 years, like really old friends for whom I don't have to explain anything to like at all. And they just get it and who just love me and who are so happy to see where I'm at. Um, And so that's been really supportive and and important to me. Um, And then I have, you know, our, our staff, Um, like, you know, my business partner, Darlene Gillard, who we started working together. We weren't friends. We started off as a working relationship. Has become one of my closest friends. She's the godmother to my son. Mm. Um, you know, and 
you know, Danielle Robinson Bell and even people who worked for us but no longer work for us, Denitria Lewis and Mary Pryor and, you know, a whole slew of other people who, you know, we, we call ourselves, we're like the mafia. Once you're in, you, you don't get out, you don't <laughs> right. like, um, but have been so incredibly supportive um, because they know what we're doing and they know that we come from a, a place of purity, right? We're pure at heart and our intentions are pure. Um, and it's been really, really helpful because there are times where it gets really hard. And I am, I don't sugarcoat this. It, there are times where I've just been like, you know what, I'm about ready to say fuck all this and just, you know, go in a corner somewhere. And, but having that support system and having people who can pull you out of the weeds, right. um, when you get in there and say, you know, okay, pick yourself up, whatever. Like, you know, do, remember who you are. Um, and that's been really, really important. And I cannot stress the importance of building a network of people who can do that for you as an entrepreneur. You you need that. Sometimes you need somebody to tell you about yourself too. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's as an entrepreneur, it's easy to get involved and get sort of closed and to get into a closed system. Um, to use a tech term. And sometimes you need somebody to refactor your code for you and get you out of that and say, you know, uh, uh-uh, this is something else. And so it's very important to have that. I cannot stress having that. Um, one of the things that we did to recognize that importance is that we have a chaplaincy program as a part of our incubator program um, ran by a wonderful woman um, named Reverend Cheryl it's non-denominational, non-spiritual, non-religious. Um, but we know how hard it is for us to be in this space. And so Reverend Cheryl provides sort of the spiritual well-being and guidance to help us work through some of these challenges that, that come up. And she's been amazing. She's done amazing work with us. That's so smart. That's incredible. Thank you for doing that um, for those women, having that there, because most people don't think about that part of it. It's all just the business part, but the wellness is part of no. You as a person and your business. That is so smart. I'm so happy well, to hear that. Well, you can't do your business if you're dead. Right, I mean, exactly. you can't do it. It's You can't run a business and have a stable business if your mind is somewhere else. Mm-hmm. and not. You just can't. And so, and that's really been our focus to make sure that, you know, people have the support they need to stay in it. Right. And stay in it. Yeah. I love that. Now, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? It's so hard to thank one person because <laughs> there's so many people. Um, I, I think the way I will answer that is like maybe the person who was the most influential or persons. And I would definitely say um, my father and my mother. Um, going back to the beginning, they never put limitations on me. And for everything that I do in my life, I see how that's become an impact. I've seen how that's impacted. From what businesses I do to even who I choose to marry, um, all of those things come back to not having limits and get, being giving permission to be myself and to think big. And that was probably the greatest impact, the greatest gift anyone could have ever given me or any child. Awesome. Beautiful. Catherine, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time and you being here and finding out, well, one, that you have a son that I can't wait to see and that you're in Atlanta because, you know, I'm relocating to Atlanta next month. Really? Oh my God, you have to stop by. Yes, I have to come see the, come stop by big and see the wall. I need a picture in front of the Oprah wall. Well, uh, you got it. Yes, got to be in front of Oprah. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Now, how can we support you before you go? What can we do? Go to, I'll have links to the website and all the things we talk about. Talk about. Is there anything else we can do to support you? Well, you know, just follow us on Twitter. Spread the word about what we're doing. Um, when you meet fabulous black woman founders, you know, let them know about us, let them know that, you know, we'll be having some activities and things coming up. Um, And that's really just spreading the word. 
and, and sending good vibes. Sending good vibes. I love that. All about good vibes. Lastly, before you go, a parting piece of advice to our audience from you. I would say it's in all your relationships, but particularly romantic relationships, partner with someone useful. Partner with someone useful. There you go. That's a good piece of advice. Thank you, Catherine. Hold on for just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you so much for listening. What you can do now is go over to supportissexypodcast.com to find other episodes with other inspiring women entrepreneurs that I've interviewed in the past. Check them out there. And while you're there, please also make sure that you subscribe to my email list so that you don't miss an episode. You don't miss any of the great resources that I share with people. I won't spam your inbox, only the good stuff. So be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com. Click on subscribe at the top and sign up for our email list. And until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.